This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. My first full-time job as a photographer was actually as a food photographer, and I was lucky enough to work with some amazing chefs and especially some amazing stylists. The dirty little secret about food photography is that it comes down a lot more to great styling and great looking food. Our job as the photographer is just not to mess it up on the day. My first experience shadowing a professional food photographer was, and this is without exaggeration, he set his tripod up near a, a table which he placed near a nice window light and uh, he called over the stylist and then she spent the next half hour, 45 minutes, arranging the dish, uh, placing elements around, looking through the camera to check the composition, moving elements around, changing little things. And then she said, okay, I'm ready. The photographer came in without a word of a lie, pressed the shutter button and that was his job done. He took the camera out and then he went to work in Photoshop. Now I'm not trying to minimize our jobs as photographers. Obviously we need to know our stuff. We need to select the right gear. We need to choose the right light. We need to accent that light and change it so that it makes things look good on the day. But a lot of what goes into food photography, at least half of the job, is that styling that goes on the table or on the food. So I wanted to make a video for you, just giving you some basic tips and tricks on how to get better results with your own food photography in your own home. Not necessarily having to have fancy lighting or very fancy camera gear. But because I'm definitely not a stylist, I decided to give my friend Vla a call. And he's a friend of mine who we work at the same company during the day and he's a very, very talented designer. He also runs his own lifestyle blog where he, he cooks and talks about healthy living and fitness and uh, he shoots his own food photography, nice kind of minimalist style for his own blog. So I thought we could go over, he could prepare some food for us and help us a bit with the styling and I can help you take your food photography up a notch. Thanks for having us. Uh, what are we cooking? So today we're gonna do three different things. We're gonna do a drink, um, uh, a really healthy, good for recovery. Um, then we're gonna do um, nice vegetarian barbecue with all the various dips and sauces um, and then we're gonna do a cake um, you gotta have a bit of cake and they'll be all uh, French themed I've just recently come back from a trip uh, in France and um, inspired by all of that and anyway I'm inspired with the French cuisine quite a lot so um, hopefully it'll be interesting all right so let's talk gear quick uh, I have got my Canon 5D Mark II. If you've watched my videos before, you know I use a few of these secondhand. I, I absolutely love the look of them and they've been workhorses for me for years. Uh, it's a full frame camera and on the front I've got uh, a Canon 100mm f2.8. This is the, uh, the non-IS version, so it's the cheaper version. Also bought it secondhand in great condition and this is an amazing lens for food photography. Um, generally speaking, when you're shooting food, you want the lens to be a longer focal length because it has the effect of compressing down the background. It's going to help you shallow your depth of field and isolate so that your hero piece of food in the middle of the plate. Um, really, really good lens to have. I've also shot uh, on full frame. I've also shot with um, the Eddy 5 1.8, which is also a very affordable, longer focal length uh, lens. Really, really good lens for food as well. And if you can get into it, uh, the tilt shift lenses, especially the Canon 90mm tilt shift lens is an amazing lens for food photography because it gives you the ability to not just shoot with that flat focal plane, but you can bend that focal plane uh, while you're playing around with your food. So you can imagine if you've got the surface of a cake and you want to bend your focal plane to include more of that surface instead of cutting a slice through it with your focus, amazing, amazing lens for uh, food photography. But we're going to keep it simple today. I've also brought with me, and this uh, little guy has quite a special place in my heart. This was one of the first cameras I bought uh, when I went professional, and I used to shoot, I probably shot for a good two years just on these. This is the old Canon 550D, which is an APS-C sensor. I used to have two of these and a couple of lenses, and I shot pro for a while. In fact, when I took my first food photo photography job, this was uh, my camera, and on the front, is the little uh, 50 mil Canon 50 mil plastic fantastic the 1.8 this lens you can pick up for no joke about 60 pounds brand new so secondhand one of these and a 50 mil 
um, which on this crop sensor will give you around 80, 85 mil. So it's gonna do the same compressing of the background, give you shallow depth of field. It's a very, very cheap solution and we'll take a shot with this later just to show you what you can do with some very cheap gear. The cake we're going to shoot is really an homage to summer in France. It, it's packed with all the berries and fruits that you can find on the Saturday market in Provence. It's got lovely raspberries, blueberries, the frosting is white, so unintentionally there's your French flag there. Uh, for me, summer in France means cherries and lavender, so, and that's exactly how we're going to finish the cake on top, to look quite florally. And the cake itself, and the recipe comes from my mom, really. She would make these cakes all the time in, in, in summer. Um, but I've adapted it a little bit. So we've got nice almond yogurt cake, fluffy and light, but also it's gluten-free and I, th there are no added sugar to it. So um, it's good for you and hopefully very delicious. So let's talk about light because like any photography, if you don't get your light right, you're not going to get the shot right. Um, I pull this table up against this nice big window. It's best to find a window where you haven't got direct sunlight coming through it, but it's nice soft diffuse bounce light coming in from outside, just some of the ambient uh, coming through and that's going to give you a nice soft light source. The next thing you want to do is to kill every other light in the room. Um, the lights in your house are probably going to have a yellowy, orangey tungsten feel to them. Uh, either way, they're not going to be the same color as daylight or very, very rarely. So make sure you're not mixing light colors from different light sources on your food. So for example, if, I, if I'm shooting this and I've got some nice cool daylight coming in, I've got some very orangey light coming in from the room, that mixing on the food often serves to make it look unappetizing and strange. So to control that, every other light goes off and you have one light source, one light color coming in through your window. Um, a nice little trick to use to kind of break that light up even more is baking paper, which most of you will have in your kitchen. I've just taken strips of this and taped it, not very well admittedly looking at it. Uh, but what that does, is it will just break up that light even more and soften it out on your food. Um, basically, I've turned the window into a daylight uh, balanced softbox and that will form my key light. So everything else is gonna work against what I have to start with, which is this key light coming in. Um, then what I'm gonna do is try and control the rest of the light. What's the rest of the light doing on the food? And a few things. The first is I usually have some white card, and that's because I can cut it into different shapes, fold it in half, and I can put this on the opposite side, and I can use it to fill the shadow light if the shadows are too deep, or even give reflections on shiny surfaces if it if it looks good. So that just sits and moves around and that will create uh, a bit of a fill light on the opposite side. If I want even more shadow on that side, very easy, just use black card. So black will obviously absorb and suck that light out. And again, I'm just cutting them into shapes and I'm gonna use that on the opposite side. I can take out reflections. Uh, the closer I bring it, I can really deepen those shadows on the opposite side as well. I can use it on the near side to block out some light and flag it a little bit and create a bit more drama to the shot as well. So that's a very good solution. And then the last thing is uh, if you, I mean, you'll all have tin foil in your kitchen, I'm sure. If you are shaping and even if you sort of crumple the surface of the tin foil and create something you can use as a little stand, you can use that on the opposite side of your food as well. Especially with fruit and rounds sort of shiny surfaces, you can create a nice little sparkle on that back edge or just a more uh, dramatic fill where you're really throwing light on the other side and evening things out. So you can see that we're not using complicated strobes, we're using a very simple window light, but there are a lot of ways that we can shape that light and make the food look really good. And we don't have to be very technical, we don't have to have a lot of gear, but we can get great results. Okay, let me show you quickly what I'm doing with this one. So uh, the way I'm shooting is I am mounted with my camera on the tripod I've got, uh, I've got everything set up, so now I can look through on live view, the camera's on live view, and I can see the cake there, and we could be just be sitting and moving a leaf here or, or a little berry there just to kind of get the, um, 
composition good and I can also see what the light's doing. If you look on the table, all I've got set up on the table there is just a, a piece of white card just to fill and I've got a little bit of foil on the back just to bounce some light back in on the berries. And that, I think at the moment, is looking pretty great. And then just to show you the other option, because dark food photography is really popular, uh, if you look on the camera here, this is the setup we've got. Uh, nice dark background, we put the same cake on that uh, same cake stand, but we changed the background out for a darker one. And if you look, what I've done, it looks a little bit ridiculous, but I've surrounded it uh, with black card. On the opposite side there, that's just sort of to uh, suck out that light on the opposite side of the light. And I've almost built a wall on the left-hand side there where the light is. And I've left a gap in between the middle just to let a little bit of light through. The problem with uh, having such a big, nice, soft light source is it's not really conducive to dark photography, so you need to kind of moody it down a little bit. So you can see, uh, we're just letting through some of that window light now in a controlled manner and we're deepening down the shadows on the right hand side there. And that gives us our dark food photography look. And then just to show you, it's not about the gear, I'm going to take this old uh, 550D which I used to use back in the day with a little plastic prime on it. So this gear, very, very cheap and we'll show you if you've got good light and good looking food, you're going to get very similar sort of shots. So for the drink, we're doing a really nice, summery, fresh fruit cocktail. Um, and I'm going to add uh, honey and thyme to it as a, as a really nice touch of Provence, as that's a typical flavor of Provence that could work really well with my usual grapefruit and ginger immune boosting uh, drink that I normally do. So uh, I think that these tastes will work perfectly. Now we're making a really lovely vegetarian barbecue. Um, you know how it is with barbecues, when you go to one, if you're a vegetarian, you'll struggle and you, you'll be lucky if you get a halloumi burger or just a skewer or a salad. Uh, but we're going to show how it can be simple to make a really nice elaborate one, tasty and nutritious. And also we've got lovely sides and dips as well prepared. So one is Ivar, which is a Serbian uh, red pepper dip, very typical. And then some, some lovely stuff from the Provencal markets. So we've got uh, aubergine caviar, for example, and then the marinades, which are just packed with flavors from south of France. Okay, so for this shot, because it's a low down uh, dish, it's kind of a flatter arrangement, we thought we'd do this on the floor and get a nice overhead shot. So I've switched to a 50mm on the camera because obviously if I'm on a longer lens, I can't really get high enough to fit in everything I want to fit in. And we're using this lovely big, uh, these doors, this huge window light here. So we've, we've done our layout on the floor um, using a nice white cloth and we've kind of arranged flowers, arranged some elements around and we're going to shoot directly above uh, the settings on the camera is ISO 100, obviously I make sure my white balance is at daylight. I'm on F2 and at 1 over 200th of a second. And again I'm putting it in live view, 
I'm zooming in to make sure that I've got my focus exactly right. And once we've kind of composed, we've kind of laid it on the camera and done all our arranging and looking at the screen and composing, we just take the shot. And there we go. And obviously we've taken a little while to do this. We kind of tweaked and looked through the camera and tweaked again. But I think we've got something that looks pretty good. So I hope that's given you some good tips and tricks. You don't need an amazing camera to take good food photographs. Just if you've got good looking food, you work a little bit on the styling, you've got a nice window light that you're controlling with those cards and by blocking out some light and bouncing but some light back in, you can get some amazing looking stuff even on a basic camera. Um, thanks so much for having us Pleasure. and for cooking for us. Um, and you've got a, an amazing blog coming out. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I finally decided to start my own blog on food, fitness and travel and how it combines into one. It's a, it's a lifestyle blog really for, for people who would like to explore places through food, cuisine, sports and, and, uh, and how to enjoy things even more. And there will be a bit of a design there as well too. Cool. And the, the recipes that we've been working with today that Vlad has been pulling yeah. together, they will be on the blog. So definitely go check it out. I'll put a link at the end. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for a new website, they really are a fantastic option. I've used them myself for a good five years now, long before I ever thought they'd be a sponsor. They have a load of beautifully designed templates, most of them lovely and minimalist, which is definitely the sort of style I prefer. And they make it very, very easy to put in your text, put in your photos, add your logos, and tweak the design so you come out with something looking very, very professional. One of the little things I like about Squarespace is they also come with a series of apps, and one of them is the Squarespace Portfolio app, and what this does is it lets you choose which pages on your website and which galleries you want to sync with this app. And it then gives you your portfolio in your pocket. I've got it on my iPad and my iPhone. So here's my people's page. And anytime I update any photos on my people's page to make it more current, it's automatically updating on these digital portfolios which I've got in my bag or my pocket. So I've got my images which I can be pulling up and showing people on the go. And it's keeping everything synced together so that it's always current. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and go to squarespace.com forward slash Sean Tucker to get 10% off your first purchase.